Hello and welcome to Unity Presbyterian Church Online. This week in worship, Pastor David takes a look at the parable of the friend at midnight as we continue our teaching through stories sermon series. Let's listen. Well, this past week was vacation Bible school. And it was just amazing in every way. We had about 70 kids roaming the halls of this church, which felt incredible. And uh, the theme was Rocky Railway. So uh, our children's director, Bailey Beam, and I, we did a skit each morning. And I got to play a character. My name was Cam Track. And I've been working on the railroad all the live long day. You see, I was the train engineer. We'll have a picture for you right up there. I think that's the first time in my life I've worn overalls. I can see the appeal, though. Deep pockets, very comfortable. But what was fun was we had a problem each day that we tell the kids about. The problem was that we had a train. It was off in that direction. And the train never could make it to the station for its delivery. There was always a different issue every day of why the train couldn't make it to the station. Now, what made this problem have high stakes especially for our children, was the contents of the train, M&Ms. Oh yes, these guys right here, we said that train is filled to the brim with M&Ms. Now let me remind you, this is a story, it's a made-up story. We didn't have a train full of M&Ms, but don't tell the kids that. The kids kept pulling me to the side every time I'd be walking around and they'd see me and they would say, Cam, Why can't you figure it out? We want our M&Ms. They became quite invested in this story to the extent that Bailey midweek made a trip to Walmart and bought (laughs) M&Ms unplanned for each and every kid because they were so invested. But what I love about this is it, to me, it shows me the power of story. I mean, a good story has the ability to capture your imagination. A good story is memorable. Uh, You'll be able to recite it years later. You're like, ah, that's this, yeah, uh, that story, it's a part of me. This story of the train filled with M&Ms captured our kids this week. And really, I think that's why Jesus taught in stories. Because Jesus knew the power of stories. And that's why we're spending this summer studying Jesus' stories or Jesus' parables because they have a way of teaching us about God in a very accessible way. So I think you're really going to like the story or the parable that we're going to study today. But first, let me begin with a question. Do you guys have one of those friends who loves to ask the outlandish what-if questions? You know, the friend who will pull you to the side and say, hey, what if you were stranded on a desert island? and you could only be stranded with one person, who would you pick? Or what if you found a genie in a bottle, and that genie granted you three wishes, what would they be? Or what if you could only eat one food for breakfast for the rest of your life? What would you eat? Now, these are ludicrous questions, but they prompt discussion. They prompt deeper thinking to say, well, what would I pick? Now, I kind of imagine Jesus starting this story in a similar way. Jesus doesn't say, what if this happened? Instead, Jesus says, suppose, suppose such and such happened. And what Jesus wants us to do is is ask ourselves, oh yeah, what would I do in that situation? Supposing that this actually happened. So here's how the story begins from Luke chapter 11. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend. Okay, so we're all thinking of a friend. Maybe narrow it down to one. Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. So here's the scenario of this story. You are living in the Middle East, and in the Middle East, hospitality was an incredibly important thing to operate off of for cultural norms. If you had a guest at your house, it was expected for you to offer them a a large meal, 
to host them overnight and make them feel like just the best guest that you ever had. But we have a problem. The problem is that the friend, the host, that's supposed to offer this hospitality, his friend arrives after a long journey much later than expected. This friend arrives at midnight. You're probably thinking to yourself, well, why would the friend still come? I mean, isn't that kind of putting out the host? But I'm sure we've all had this happen before, where maybe you're going to host someone, but their flight's delayed, and you're picking them up at the Charlotte airport at 1130 at night. Or maybe your friend or family were going to road trip to you, and they got stuck in that Atlantic, Atlanta traffic and were hours later than they said. This sort of thing happens. And so the friend was delayed and shows up at his house at midnight. That's the first problem. But the second problem was that the host obviously was not expecting him this day and had no food, no loaves of bread to share, which according to Middle East hospitality is a big deal. So what is this friend supposed to do? Well, this friend has another friend, obviously someone he's close to because he thinks, ah, I can go to this person's house, even though it's midnight. I can knock on his door and I can ask for some loaves of bread. Problem solved. That should be an easy enough solution, right? Should be. Here's what happens next. Jesus says, and suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Well, apparently they weren't as close of friends as he thought. I mean, what kind of friend would say that? Don't bother me. No, I'm not going to go and give you what you're asking for. And this friend has, has two really kind of lame excuses. Uh, the first is he says, the door is already locked. To which I would say, oh, I have a solution for that. You, you just unlock the door. That's all you do. It's, it's quite a simple fix. And the second thing he says is, my children, they're already in bed. Now, that is legitimate if he has a newborn. If he has a newborn, you let that newborn sleep. You say, sorry, you go find your own loaves of bread. We're not waking up the newborn. But if they're kids of any other age, you wake them up. They go back to sleep. It's not a big deal. But this friend, this friend is not responding in a way you'd expect a friend to respond why? What is going on here? The story continues. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of your friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So the friend, who's not really a good friend, eventually gives, gets up, and gives the friend what he needs. It takes him a while, and what we, as, as the reader, are supposed to ask is, what was the motivation? What finally caused him to go downstairs, unlock the door, and give him some bread? Well, we're told in this story that unfortunately the motivation was not his friendship. Jesus says it's not because he's friends with you that he's going to go and give you the bread that you desire. But instead, it's because of these two words that I highlighted— which really stood out to me in the scripture. It's because of your shameless audacity. That's the reason that he'll eventually give you bread. It's because this person is so bold that he's going to go to your house at midnight and knock on the door until you give him what he wants. Think of friends in your lives that you would feel comfortable enough going to their house at midnight, waking them up, in case you needed something. That's probably a pretty short list of friends, isn't it? And Jesus is saying in this parable, it's not even because he's a good friend, but it's because of his boldness, his persistence, that he eventually gets what he wants. Now, every parable has a meaning. Every parable, every story is told, not just because it's an interesting story, but to teach us something about God. 
So what does this story of two friends arguing about bread at midnight have to teach us about God? This is Jesus' conclusion. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Yes, what Jesus reveals here is that this parable is about prayer. It's about communicating with God. It's about talking honestly with God about your needs. Every story, uh, the people in the story are, are representatives of someone else. So, so who represents us in the story? Well, it's the person knocking on the door. It's the person at midnight saying, hey, this is what I need. So what God is saying is that we, when we go to God in prayer, we need to go with confidence. We need to go with boldness. We need to approach God with a certain sense of even audacity when we're presenting our needs to God, saying, God, this is what's truly on my heart. This is what I want to share with you. God, I'm not holding back in this conversation. This is what I want to say. With the same boldness as a friend knocking on a door at midnight, Jesus is saying we should approach God knocking and seeking and asking and sharing our authentic selves. One thing that really stood out to me is that that beginning uh, line where Jesus simply says, ask, which to me implies actually praying, actually spending the time and saying, God, this is what's on my heart. This is what I feel is a need right now. How often do we think about praying without actually praying? Or how often do we wonder, oh, does prayer even really work, without simply going to God and saying, God, I'm going to talk with you. I'm going to humbly ask and seek and knock. Yeah, I, I believe that what this parable is, is trying to teach us is that we, in our prayer lives, should initiate conversation with God. Don't hold back. To go beyond that, perhaps the parable is saying that we should pray with a certain level of confidence. How would you describe your prayer life today? And would you use the word confidence when you are approaching God? When I think of my own prayer life, I don't think I would use that word. But this parable is encouraging us in that direction. Now you might be wondering, okay, if we represent the person who's knocking on the door at midnight, telling him what we want, who does God represent in this story? Because God generally is represented by someone in the story. But in this story, God is not represented. No, the friend who doesn't give you the bread and then eventually relents and gives you the bread, that friend is just supposed to represent a friend. Because we all have good friends that sometimes come through for us, and sometimes do not, right? Friends sometimes fail us. But the point is that if our friends eventually try to do the right thing, how much more will God? I mean, God who's not limited, God who doesn't make the same mistakes that humans make, how much more is God willing to interact with you when you are approaching God with a need? You know, here's the way that that Jesus kind of summarizes all of this up. These are the last three verses in this parable. He says, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. You know, what this is saying is that if we as humans, we try to do the right thing, we try to do right by one another, but we'll still fail. You'll get hurt by people. Nobody's perfect. But even if in our imperfection, we try to do the right thing, 
how much more is God willing to do to those who ask? And so ask, seek, knock. Go to God in prayer. Uh, Have you heard that phrase, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take? You think about that in basketball. If you're too scared to take a shot, well, then you're not going to make any shots. And it's the same thing in prayer. And we're too scared that God's not going to answer our prayer, and so we don't pray at all. Well, 100% of our prayers will remain unanswered if we don't pray them. Ask, seek, knock, go to God in prayer. Because if our earthly parents try to do the right thing, how much more will our heavenly Father? I mean, I love this, this illustration that Jesus uses, saying no human father, if their son asked for a fish, would give a snake instead. I mean, can you imagine if your son at the dinner table was like, hey, can you pass the salmon? I'll do one better. Here's a copperhead. No, no father would do that. But that is kind of God's point. It's that God knows what you need before you even ask. So go to God in prayer. Now, here's what I don't want you to do today when you go home. I don't want you to think, okay, Pastor David wants me to pray boldly. And so, God, I I know that this lottery is going on right now. And I know that vaccinated individuals could win a million dollars. So, God, won't you have me win that million? And then if you don't, go, God, see, I told you prayer doesn't work. See, this is why there's unanswered prayer. Don't do that. God does answer prayers. Sometimes that answer is no. And can you imagine if God said yes to every person who prayed for that winning lottery number? That just wouldn't work. So here's what you should do instead. You should pray boldly, the ask, seek, knock, while also being humble enough to live with unanswered prayer. Can you hold these two things in tension? Boldness in prayer on the one hand, and humbleness in unanswered prayer on the other. I I hope so. Maybe you can imagine it like this. Imagine that you are walking down a path in a wooded forest with trees all around you, and it's so dense that you can only see 10 feet in front of you. That represents the human experience. We're limited. Our perspective is limited. We can only see so far ahead. And now imagine what God sees. God who created the path that you're walking on. God who created the forest that surrounds you. Imagine God having almost a bird's eye view, seeing everything. That's God's perspective. And so we humbly acknowledge our limited perspective as humans while still walking on that path, praying to God, asking boldly for what is on our hearts. This is how God wants us to understand prayer. I would say that the bottom line of this parable is to pray and to trust. Amen. If you would like more information about Unity Presbyterian Church, please visit our website at www.unitypres.com. Org, or visit us on Facebook. This is the Unity Presbyterian Church Podcast. Have a great week.